uh, first Wednesday, so we'll be taking communion together this evening. We have uh, some special needs that we want to believe God for tonight and, and for healing for uh, people that are in our family that are sick and just need God to touch them. Amen. And so as we remember uh, what he did for us on Calvary this evening, we want to remember them and, uh, in prayer. want to remember Sister Glenna Justice in prayer and ask God to help her and Brother Justice as well. Um, Anthony's uh, grandfather had a heart attack today and we want to pray for him that God would touch him. We've um, also Jason Easter's grandfather un underwent open heart surgery. We want to pray for him. Uh, the enemy, he just uh, continues to, there is a, a, as we are well aware in this house, and um, there is a spirit that is attacking the church in this hour, and it is not something that's just to our own, uh, us individually, but it is corporately in the body of Christ. I believe that it is a, an attack. It's not an attack on all the churches, but the churches that are preaching the gospel Churches that are declaring the kingdom of God is an, a strategic attack of hell that has come against them and uh, receive calls even today of, of pastors that are warring with these spirits. And so we believe that God has already given us the victory. Amen. He has already caused us to be victorious over every situation and circumstance that the enemy will bring against us. And that it's because of the finished work of Calvary. It's the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he did for us that we can walk in victory uh, every day of our lives. And uh, I just want to, to teach here for a few moments tonight before we receive our communion, if that'll be all right. And uh, so in Exodus chapter 6, we read there that um, Exodus chapter 6 and verse number 1, the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to Moses, I am the Lord. Amen. We know that all of us need to be reminded of that every once in a while. God said to Moses, I am the Lord. Now, certainly Moses already knew it, but God was just reaffirming to him. He said, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my, my name, the Lord, I was not known to them. This word uh, Lord here is uh, in the Hebrew, it is El Shaddai. And so he was saying, they don't know me as the almighty God. They don't know me as the God of uh, more than enough. Amen. Uh, sometimes we just trust God just to get by. I've heard people pray and say even in their testimony time or talking that all they want is enough money to pay their bills. Uh, and I thought how selfish that is. All I want is money to pay my bills. So if you, all we asking for and believing for is money to pay our bills, then how can we be a blessing to anybody else? How can we advance the kingdom of God? Because the truth of it is, is we may not want to, you know, sometimes we get on these spiritual hypes and we act like all we need is God. But uh, in this world we live in, if you have money, it's going to drive everything. Money drives everything. Money is power. Amen. That's the reason why, well, I shouldn't go into that. But anyways, that, that's the reason why we have in these uh, politicians that are spending billions of dollars for a job that pays hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, you figure that out. Amen. Spending millions of dollars to try to get into a position 
that doesn't even pay what they're investing in their campaign. And so you see money, but it is because they have money. Uh, Proverbs said money answers everything. And this has nothing to do with what I'm going to tell you, but I'm just going to tell you about it. He said money answers everything, right? Uh, and so it is the money that drives this, this society. You can, you, can ha- you can believe a thing. You can know a thing. But if you don't have the finances to get a platform to speak what is truth, then that truth is never known. And so it takes finances, amen, to advance the kingdom of God. And God told him him here, he said, I am El Shaddai. I'm the God of more than enough. I am all powerful. I am everything, right? He is all power. He's the one that is self-sufficient. And so he's telling him here, he said, I, this is who I am, but they don't know me as this. They know me as get by God. They know me as help me make it through God. But he said, I want them to know that I am El Shaddai. I am the God of more than enough. I am the one that is all sufficient, self-sufficient, right? And he said, I have the power to be able to bless them in this manner. And so God wants us to be blessed tonight. Amen. He wants us to be blessed. And he said, I am the God, the Almighty. I am the El Shaddai. I am the all-powerful one. I'm the self-sufficient one. I am the one that has all sources available, and I am that God. And so he's telling them this. And then he said, also, I establish my covenant with them to give them a land of Canaan, the land their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom Egypt, Egyptians kept in bondage and I have remembered my covenant. I mean, no, God always remembers his covenant. God never, never breaks covenant and he's, he's a covenant God. And uh, then he goes on and he tells them, and this is where I want to look at here tonight, verse six and seven. He said, therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. He says, I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with a great judgment. I will take you as my people and I will bring, uh, be your God and then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And then verse eight, and I will bring you into a land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as an heritage because I am the Lord. This is the covenant that God makes with his people. He said, I have remembered my covenant. And then he tells what that covenant is. He says there's four things here in particular. He says that He is, first of all, that he is the Lord that will bring them out of their burdens or their oppression. Amen. And uh, this is a promise, this covenant that God made with Abraham, that we can grab hold of this as well. That we don't have to be a people that are oppressed. We don't have to be a people that is under the burdens and the weights of this world all along. God wants to take that oppression off of us. He wants to take those burdens off of us. We see the children of Israel was under Pharaoh's burdens or bondage or oppression, but we can look at it today and we can see that we have our own Pharaohs. They, they may not be, we may not be stuck at mixing brick and mortar and and all of that kind of thing, but we have things that are oppressing us. But God said, I want them to know that I am the God that will bring you out from under the burden of the oppressor. And so tonight, that that faithful God, that God, that El Shaddai God, that God that is all powerful, he's the one that has made this covenant with us. Amen. And that's what God was speaking to the children of Israel. He was speaking to them and says, I'm going to do this for you because I am your God. I've made a covenant with Abraham. And then he goes on and he says, 
and uh, the second I will, he said, I will rescue you from their bondage. Praise God. I said the other Sunday, and I said it, at, referred to it again this Sunday, but uh, we're saying again tonight that I don't believe that Jesus paid such a price for us to be saved and remain in bondage. Amen. But we can be set free from the addictions. We can set free from the habits. Amen. We can be set free from those things that the enemy has brought us into bondage in. If it is in, in the form of sin, if it is in the form of just uh, bad habits that have been established and brought bondage to our mind, bondage to our thinking, bondage to the way that we live or even how we believe. Amen. God is able to bring that. He says, I'm going to rescue you from your bondage. And so God is wanting to rescue us. You know, there's a lot of things we need to be rescued from. And some of them have been taught up in the church. It wasn't that it was uh, that they be didn't um, believe that they was teaching right, but it was bad thinking. It was poverty thinking. It was bad mentality thinking. Amen. And, and there is a, a, a sect in the church or a group in the church that, that have been taught that all of their life. And they still don't believe that, it, that it's good or it's godly to be blessed in this present world. They think somehow that we've got to wait to go to heaven to be blessed. But how many know that devil is a liar? God wants us to be blessed in the earth. But you see, so many times we develop our, the concepts, we develop our, the, the things that uh, who God is or what God can do based upon the circumstances in which we have lived out in life. And so that's the reason why that many people have these mindsets. And I'm talking about rescuing you from bondage because bondage many times is only in our mind, right? And so it's the way we think. It's the way because of the way we were brought up. Uh, and, we, and we developed a way of thinking or a concept. And so God says to Israel, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to get you back from a rescue you excuse me from that bondage some people uh i feel you know have different ways of thinking about different things but whenever people have been brought up you know uh, there's i know some folks think that it's bad today and all of that but whenever you read about the great depression that we got it pretty good amen but whenever people have been brought up through that depression, they, they want to hold on to everything. Amen. I seen one man that had gone through that depression and he had a $5 bill before Abe had a beard. You'll get that on the way home. Amen. But we hold on to things because we don't know if we're going to get anything else. Right? And so it is that we hold on to, but the only way that we can receive is to give. And so the bondage comes that we hold on to and hoard everything until we are not willing to give. Right? Because our mindset and what we was brought through tells us you might not get any more. So hold on to what you've got. Amen? And so another way of thinking is that bondage is, is in our minds. Is, that's just one example. I'm not putting anybody down. That's just an example. But we have ways of thinking. We think that, this, that you know, for instance, there are some people that don't believe that God heals anymore. There are some people that believe that God's great and he's wonderful and he, he paid an awesome price for us to be saved, but they don't believe that God still heals. Amen. How many know that's a bondage? A bondage that's in our minds that we have been formed by the traditions of men that have made the word of God of no effect. And so he says, I'm going to re rescue you from this bondage. I'm going to get you out of that. Glory to God. And so God is, is, is saying to Israel, this is my covenant with you. I'm going to rescue you from that bondage. And then he said, I'm going to redeem you 
with an outstretched arm and with a great judgment. I'm going to redeem you. It means to purchase or to buy back, right? To redeem. We know what it is to take something and redeem it. He said that, that you could redeem the firstborn with a lamb, right? If you didn't uh, kill the firstborn, it could be redeemed with a lamb, the sacrifice. And so uh, it is redeemed. It is taking something and giving for something else in exchange. And he, he's telling Israel, I'm going to redeem you with my outstretched arm. Praise God. Israel don't know what God's up to. They don't know what he's talking about at this time. But this is his covenant. This is his promise. And then he said, I will take you as my people and I will be your God and then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of Egypt. So he promises them, I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to redeem you. And I'm going to take you. Bring you, rescue you, redeem you, and take you. This is the covenant that God makes with Abraham, with Israel. And he, he is true to his word. Amen. He said, I'm going to free you from your oppression. I will rescue you from the slavery of Egypt and I will redeem you with a powerful and a great act of judgment. And then he said, I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Amen. This is obviously in the Old Testament, we understand, but it is a shadow and a type or a picture of what would happen on Calvary. Amen. He tells them, I'm going to free you from the oppressor. I'm going to bring you out of slavery, with slavery of sin, of bondage. Amen. I'm going to redeem you with my powerful uh, hand and great act of judgment. And then I'm going to claim you as my own because of the price that Jesus paid on the cross of Calvary. Right? They, they knew that, that whenever Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he fulfilled this even in the New Testament for you and I. Because there are some things that stop at Calvary, but there are other things that go through the filter of the cross and come out on the other side. And the covenant that God made with Abraham is one of them. Amen. It is still we can hold on to those promises and the, the, the word of God that God has given. But how many know that God, when God gives you a promise such as this, when God gives you a word and he speaks to you, but then it doesn't happen instantaneously that sometimes it's easy to forget what God has promised. Amen. Because this is, this is not something that happened instantly. God remembered his covenant. He spoke his covenant again with them, but it did not happen. But each of these cups reveals God's uh, desire to do something in his life. It, each of them shows that he is these I wills. It shows that he is going to do something significant in their life. And so he's going to bring about spiritual transformation. He is going to change them from who they are to what he desires for them to be. But they live for 400 years in Egypt's bondage. Even though God speaks to them, even though God reminds them of what he is going to do, 400 years, they're in bondage. 400 years, and it, it, they don't see God bringing them out. 400 years, and he doesn't look like he's rescuing them from bondage. It doesn't look like he's redeeming them. It doesn't look like he's the, it, that they are his people, right? We see all of this going on and yet it seems like that what God is saying that it just isn't showing up. It isn't being visible to the children of Israel. 
And that is true to us sometimes. There are times in our lives whenever God will give us a word through his scripture. He'll give us a a, a season that he'll speak into our lives. Amen. And those things that he speaks many times is the same thing he has spoke in the past. It's just a reminder of what he has already said. And, and he, he reminds us that, that he hasn't changed his mind, that he is true to his word and he's going to watch over his word and he's going to bring it to pass. And that's what happens here. We see that the children of Israel go through 400 years of bondage and we see the plagues after this chapter where the plagues begin to come. And we see the night with the frogs. We see all of the, the, uh, the things that took place and the locusts and all of the curses that came upon uh, Pharaoh and his people. But we also see the, the blood covenant that comes whenever the death angel comes and they would take the lamb and, and crucify the lamb and they would put the blood on the doorpost, right? And when the death angel would come, he would pass over them because there was already a death in the house. And so all of these things are taking place in the process of time. But it is a shadow and a type. It is a picture of what is going to take place on Calvary. And that God is going to fulfill in his son Jesus Christ. He is going to do it for them naturally, but he's going to do it for us spiritually. That he is going to redeem us once and for all. And he's going to bring us out from under the land, the hand of the bondage and the taskmaster. And he's going to deliver us from the bondage of the enemy. He's going to rescue us from this this work of the enemy that he is trying to oppress us and bring us down. But God has already redeemed us through the cross of Calvary. It's not something we're trying to get. It's not something we're hoping for. It's not something that we're working for. It is already done in Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. So it's the finished work of Calvary that has redeemed me. It has rescued me. It has brought me out from Egypt's bondage or sin of the world and has brought me into the blessing of the Father God that I know that he is Lord, that I know that he is El Shaddai, that I know that he is the God of more than enough that he will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory, that he is self-sufficient. That means that he doesn't need anything else, but he is God all by himself. And so what he has promised, he will watch over and he will bring it to pass. Amen. Many times we want it to happen quickly. How many like it to happen fast? in a hurry two of you the rest of you need to come quickly we all like for it to happen now amen we want we want the promise and we want want what he has spoken we want it at the same time Unfortunately for us, there is always a time between the promise and the provision. Amen. There is a wilderness <laughs> between the promise and the land of promise. There's things that separate us, that work out of us the things that are not like Christ. It's the David that was anointed king as a young boy, but only took his place after he had went through training for reigning. Amen? And it's all of that that goes on, and God says, gives us the promise so we'll have something to hold on to because faith is a substance of things hoped for. If he don't give you anything, then you have nothing to hope for in the middle of the trial, the middle of the fire, the middle of the battle. We give up and grow weary and we quit. 
But faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I didn't see that he was my burden bearer. I didn't see that he was the one to rescue me. I didn't see him as El Shaddai, but he told me he was. Amen. And he said, this is what I'm going to do for you. And so tonight, I just want us to remember that sometimes in this life, it doesn't always happen quick, fast, and in a hurry. Sometimes it, most of the time, it doesn't even happen on our time schedule and our plan. And, that, and that's not enjoyable for anyone, but he's still God and he's still a God of his word. And so what he says, he will bring it to pass. Amen. God is speaking to us here and I believe as he spoke to the children of Israel, he speaks to us and he reminds us from time to time that I will do what I said I was going to do. I'm going to fulfill my word over your life. How many times has God been faithful to us? We didn't, it didn't happen the way we thought it was going to happen. But he did it. He made a way. He provided somehow. I just want to say tonight to you that as we remember the Lord, and the Lord's Supper tonight, remember that he's faithful to his word. Remember that what he has promised and what we're about to do here tonight is, is remember these, this is the promise that God gave to them before they went into this time of fiery trials and difficulty he said I'm going to bring you out I'm going to rescue I'm going to redeem you and you're going to be mine that's what happened at Calvary he did all of that for us spiritually and so when we take this cup and this bread tonight remember that he's going to bring us out from under the burden of the oppressor tonight whatever may be burdening you down whatever bondage the enemy may be trying to create in your mind God's going to rescue you from it he's going to redeem you with these outstretched arms what did he do whenever he went to Calvary he stretched out his arms amen and with those outstretched arms he redeemed us amen from the curse of the law what is the curse of the law sin sickness disease and the devil amen he redeemed us from all of that and he called us his own, glory to God. He called us his children. And so let's remember that tonight as we partake of his, the, the table. And let's remember, and then we're going to pray. If you have any special needs, we're going to pray for them. But we're also going to pray for those who aren't here tonight. We're going to believe God to touch them.